some slide yesterday that uh, referred to, to uh, two times six conceptions of embodiment uh, from papers written 10 years ago by, by Margaret Wilson and myself. And if you, if you had a quick look at those, you might have noticed that they actually didn't overlap very much, so it was actually 11 or so. <laughs> and uh, but, but by now, um, there are too many different conceptions to, to, to even list them here. Um, I, I just want to bring up one distinction or one question, um, which actually also comes also come from a paper, from the same paper that I wrote 10 years ago, in which I raised the question whether or not robots are actually embodied. Uh, the point of the question is, of course, that to some degree, obviously they are because they're physical, they interact with the environment and so on. But on the other hand, um, you, you could very well argue, and we can get back to that in the discussion, you could very well argue that, that they're missing much of the embodiment that characterizes human embodied cognition or any animal embodied cognition. And people have tried to, to, to capture that, um, uh, have tried to capture the, the difference in, in different ways. Um, well, I, for example, Try to refer to, to the idea of organismic embodiment and um, Ezekiel Di Paolo uh, made a distinction between deep embodiment and shallow embodiment. I think that talk is also online on the EU Cognition website. And more recently, um, Mark Stapleton has, has used the term um, proper embodiment. And all of these um, have some kind of uh, joint core, you could say, um, and, and, and the idea that there is something to living systems that, that robots simply don't have, at least not at this point. Time. But as I said, uh, we can get back to that later. Then I think it's also important to point out that there are different, there are actually a number of different views of, or, or different basic uh, philosophical mindsets behind the idea of embodied cognition. Um, some, a couple of times yesterday, you could easily get the impression that, that there's a distinction simply between the traditional camp and the embodied camp and that in the embodied camp everybody agrees on, on one thing or on, at least on rejecting what, what the traditional people um, have thought. But that's, uh, that's a little bit too simple, of course. Um, so, so I would propose um, you have to distinguish at least between these three or four types. On the one hand, there's of course the, the thing, well, the idea that we call the classical view, um, <coughs> which um, can be characterized in philosophical terms as computational functionalism. And then there's something uh, that, that goes under the label symbol grounding, for example. So people like Harnett or Kangelosi and then also Arcelou in, 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 um, uh, uh, in the more psychological side. Um, and something that, that really is, is, is a form of robotic functionalism rather than the old computational functionalism. So people adhering to this view do say that cognition is embodied, but they still believe that cognition is computation, so it's still computational symbol manipulation, but those symbols need grounding. And there are other people, um, which I've clumped together here under the label, an active dynamical, which, which reject functionalism altogether. And then, for example, John Searle would fall into that category. And I think that's an important distinction that people often ignore in AI, that um, the, the, the AI criticisms of Searle and Harmon although they, they might sound similar, were actually came to, to, came to opposite conclusions. One of them rejected computationalism, the other one endorsed computationalism. Okay, and then within this uh, an active dynamical camp, you can of course uh, make a further distinction um, between, on the one hand, people that, that do believe that representations play a role, and other people that do believe that representations don't play a role. And then, again, if you're philosophically minded, you can, you can ask if that's really a difference. If they really disagree about the need for representation or if they just disagree about the, uh, the use of the word. Okay, but there's a, there's a workshop, a whole workshop on representation, I think, in the, in the afternoon, um, where, where that, uh, people might want to address that question. Okay. So, so much for the background, then let's get to some examples um, of embodiment in, in human cognition. Um, <clears throat> as I said, the, the, the focus here is on embodiment effects in, in human cognition and social interaction, and the focus is on, on evidence from neural and behavioral sciences. Um, there's a relatively simple take-home message, and that is that in, in human cognition, Cognitive, affective, and bodily mechanisms are, are largely inseparable. inseparable. 
and in, in many cases it would even be difficult to to to, to tell which is which and, and to, to, to keep them apart. Um, one thing to note maybe is, is that I'll, I'll give a large number of examples here. Um, so so I'll, I, I won't be discussing any of them in much detail, but I'll provide all the original references. So, so don't, don't ask me of the details of how exactly, in which experiment, what exactly the, the experimental pro protocols were, or how many seconds the subjects had for which task and so on. Um, all that you can find in the original papers. The point of, of this talk is to, to give a large number of examples and to illustrate that the embodiment effects are really found in, in uh, a large number of, of human cognitive uh, processes and mechanisms. Okay. So let's start with some examples of, of bodily responses. And I think uh, nobody will find uh, these particularly uh, surprising. So for example, um, um, somebody did experiments with or observed uh, um, the postures that, uh, that high school students uh, uh, adopted when receiving grades and um, hardly surprising, at least from today's perspective, um, people who get good grades, um, well, assume a more erect posture, whereas people who get bad grades uh, do the opposite. Um, so that's just a, a simple simple uh, result. Um, you find uh, similar effects for, for effective facial responses. Um, so if, for example, you monitor people's um, facial muscles um, using EMG, electromyography, um, and, and you, you show them visual scenes um, that are pleasant or unpleasant, um, then uh, you, can, you can show that the pleasant scenes do, uh, do make people smile either um, overtly or, or sub-threshold, sub and unpleasant scenes, of course, produce negative impressions. Uh, as I said, this, is, uh, this isn't really, uh, all of these results are more than 20 years old, so this isn't really, they could show that the corresponding mouse, hand, leg areas of motor corsets exhibited increased activation, although, of course, no overt action was required. And uh, very similar, um, very similar experiment um, using fMRI brain imaging, um, they let people passively listen to similar sentences, action related sentences, uh, describing mouse hand leg motions. And of course, uh, not surprisingly, um, those activate parts of premotor cortex. Again, I think this is in this community a well known finding by now that, that brain areas related to motor activity are. Um, are activated in, in perceptual tasks where no actual motor action is required. Okay, let's continue. Um, let's continue to more complex behavioral responses then. Um, so, so those, so far, we've talked about relatively passive responses. Um, then behavioral responses. Um, this is from the, from the mid-90s. Um, John Bark and colleagues um, let subjects form um, sentences from short word lists, and then usually either priming them with a social stereotype, so for example, um, uh, the words gray, Florida, and bingo for priming an elderly stereotype, or just priming them with neutral words, well, not priming them in that case. And interestingly, they could show that that primed subject, after they thought the experiment was over, actually took longer to walk, uh, so, so subjects that were primed with, in this case, the elderly stereotype, actually took longer to walk from the lab to the elevator than the control room. Uh, and that now, as I said, I mean, all the previous examples were relatively simple, but now we start to, I mean, some people are, are smiling, laughing, so now we get to the kind of results um, that are unexpected and that are crazy stuff, <laughs> as, as Rolf called it, because you wouldn't really expect this, would you? Um, you wouldn't think that just because you, you mentioned the words gray, Florida, and bingo, that that suddenly makes people move more slowly, even after some time has passed. Okay, um, more examples of that type in a, in a very similar setup. Um, so the, uh, the experiment has showed subjects uh, different animals, and either fast or slow animals. And again, which is hardly surprising if you know the previous result, um, subjects primed with fast animals 
of course, subsequently took less time walking to another room than the ones primed with fast animals. Um, another one that he goes on the level of uh, social responses. Um, so uh, it takes it one step further in the sense that this is not just about sensory motor behavior, but actually about social interaction. So uh, in some uh, other experiment, um, when Bart and colleagues primed subjects with word, really with words related to either rudeness, um, so for example, aggressively, or to politeness, so for example, patiently, and a control group, of course, with unrelated words. And after walking to another room, subjects triggered with, with the rude or the polite words were actually more or less likely to interrupt the conversation between two people in that room. So people that had words, had heard words like, or had been, uh, uh, had been given words like aggressively and so on, um, did actually act more rudely or more aggressively, although they hadn't been given any task of that type. Okay. Um, let's have a couple of other examples. Um, by the way, these categories, um, they strongly overlap, as, as, as you'll notice. So um, what, what I call behavioral responses or Effective responses is, is not uh, not clear cut categories. These are just one way of, of going through a large body of work um, in, in some serial order. Okay, um, an example uh, from arm motion uh, related to effective states. Um, in, 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 ex uh, in an experiment by Kachapo and colleagues, um, the subject viewed uh, neutral Chinese ideographs. So the, the subjects were not Chinese, so they didn't know what what those pictures stood for. Um, and they were either pushing upward on the table, um, so simulating some kind of approach behavior, or pushing downward, so some kind of avoidance behavior. And in later ratings, so after they had done that, pushing up or pushing down, in later ratings, um, of course, um, hardly surprising, if you, if you know the story I'm trying to tell here, um, the idea graphs seen in, in an approach mode were rated more positively than those seen in an avoidance mode. So they, they, nobody, none of the subjects understood anything what those pictures stood for, but because they had been paired with, with, with different types of motion that have different effective value for, for, for the subject, um, they, they were associated, they were rated more positively or negatively. The same you can of course do with, with different types of motion. Um, head motion is another example. Um, so, uh, in, in this experiment by, by Tom and colleagues, um, the subjects, um, well, the subjects were given headphones and they were given some music to listen to and they were told that the experiment was about um, whether or not they could shake, the, the headphones would fall off if they shake their head. So one group of participants was, was nodding and the other one was shaking their head like that. And when later they were offered but by an experimenter, which didn't know, by the way, which group they belonged to, so by a naive experimenter, when later they were offered a pen that had been lying on the table or that they had not seen before, it would be the case that people that had been nodding would prefer the pen that they had seen because they had seen the pen and they would be nodding, so they made a positive association between uh, yeah, the uh, associated something positively with the pen because they had been nodding in the presence of that pen. Whereas the other people who shook their heads, of course, would, would reject the pen that they had seen while shaking their head and would prefer, prefer a new pen. Um, and um, similar, uh, you could do similar um, experiments with, with face muscles. Um, and this is the case with the, with the pen between your teeth. Um, in this experiment by, by, by Schlag and uh, colleagues, um, the subjects had to rate cartoons while holding a pen. Um, some of them held the pen between their teeth, and the others held the pen between their lips. And in, in the one case, if you hold it between your teeth, that tends to activate the muscles that are also active when you're smiling. In the other case, it tends to activate the muscles that are active when you're frowning. And, well, hardly surprising, um, although it was surprising before we knew all this, but 
um, hardly surprising from, from the perspective now, the people holding the pen with their teeth, um, because the smiling muscles were activated, of course rated the cartoons as funnier than those holding it between their lips. Again, this is, uh, um, yeah, it makes sense maybe from the perspective of the cup was on the side. On the same side as the hand that they were using, they were faster than in the other case, which of course, again, is somewhat surprising because uh, you wouldn't really, well, there's no strong connection other than both of them, uh, both cases, the, the, the hand, the handle on the cup and thereby the imaginary action of, of grasping the cup. Um, and the, the movement, the response movement, um, both activate the right hand, but uh, at, at a cognitive level, of course, they're completely, um, otherwise completely disconnected. Okay, similar, um, similar compatibility effects can be shown, of course, also for, for, for other body parts or other types of movement. Um, Glenberg and Kashak, for example, uh, as subjects to, to judge the sensibility of sentences, and um, in that case, the, the, the response was, was by, by either pulling a lever towards you, um, no, moving your hand towards you, or, or uh, moving away from you. And as we've already seen from, from some previous result, um, well, moving your hand towards you is associated with something positive, because that's what we do with positive things, um, interesting food or whatever it could be. We move them towards ourselves. And where dangerous things, we, we move away from ourselves. And so in this case, um, it turned out that uh, whenever people had to uh, give a positive response by, by, by moving the hand towards themselves, that was much easier for them than to associate this with a positive response and the other way around. It was easier to associate this with a negative response than this. Um, and in this case, they, they, were come, yeah, they, were given, uh, they were given they given they were given sense and sentences such as uh, yeah, close the drawer. Um, okay, I think I'm mixing up mixing up two results here. Actually, in this particular case, it's not what I just said. That's the result of a different experiment. But here, the case is the compatibility is between the sentence um, that they're looking at. Close the drawer is, of course, the movement away from you. And um, there were other sentences that were about opening the drawer. Or so so the, the, the compatibility is here between the action that they had to carry out and the action um, that is described in the sentence. <coughs> and um, yeah, this is similar. Um, this is a similar experiment as, as moving levers. And in this case, the subjects were asked to respond to positive to respond to positively or negatively balanced words by indicating their valence, pulling the lever towards themselves or pushing it away. And in this case, um, the result is what I said on the previous slide, namely that for subjects responded faster to positive words by pulling the lever towards them and faster to negative words by pushing it away. So it's easier to make, to associate this movement um, with positive response and it's easier to, to associate this movement with a negative response. A couple of uh, examples that have to do with judgment and decision making. Um, these are relatively recent results from Ackerman uh, last year, published in Science. And um, in this case, what they did uh, was to 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 take uh, well relatively randomly picked people passing by and letting them, uh, putting them in a, in, a, in a situation where they were supposed to evaluate job candidates. That's of course a fake situation, obviously, if you do it with passes by, but to evaluate job candidates by reviewing resumes on either a light or a heavy clipboard. And I think um, you get an idea of where this is heading, um, because the participants using the heavy clipboards rated the candidates better overall, and also as displaying more serious uh, more serious interest in the position. So, uh, just to be very clear about this, there was one group that looked at a resume and on, a, on a heavy clipboard, and another group looked on the very same resume, uh, looked at the very same resume on, on, on a light clipboard, and the people that looked at the, that had that heavy clipboard um, rated the person more positively. 
um, than the people having the light uh, clipboard. Because well, on a metaphorical level, um, we, we believe that, that, that heaviness and seriousness are in, in some sense associated. Um, so this is this is another this is a good illustration of, of uh, again a result that you wouldn't necessarily expect and a result uh, where metaphor comes in where things uh, where it's not the the literal meaning of, 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 of the thing that plays the role it's not they they didn't rate the candidate as more heavy or as overweight or something like that that would be maybe an obvious reaction but they actually um, break them as, as, as more serious, as, as the better candidate, as, as more interested in the position, although the other people looking at, are looking at exactly the same CV. So there's an obvious transfer here from things in the sensory motor domain to, to, to judgments in the cognitive domain, in the decision-making domain. Okay, and yeah, participants using the heavy clipboard also rated their own accuracy higher than the people with the light uh, clipboard. Okay, a couple of um, more experiments uh, from that from that paper. Um, so they, they also let, um, of course, other subjects uh, read a passage describing an ambiguously balanced social situation. So it wasn't entirely clear whether the people in the situation um, were, were friends or opponents, for example. And before reading, they gave the participants a, a five-piece puzzle to solve, and then yeah, for the one group, the, the pieces were covered in rough sandpaper, and in the other case, the, um, the, uh, the, the puzzle was, was, was left as it is uncovered, and then the pieces were relatively smooth. And the results indicate that the participants who completed the rough puzzle also rated the interaction as less coordinated, as, as more difficult, as more harsh, as less uh, less smooth. It's a, again, this is a is an, is an example of, of where something is transferred from the sensory motor domain, something smooth or, or something rough, and that is transferred to, to, to judging a, in this case a social situation, which in some sense can 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 be judged as smooth or rough, although in a, obviously just in a metaphorical sense. Okay, and. Uh, Another example exactly from, from that very same paper. Um, in another experimental setup, they had participants sitting in either a hard wooden chair or a soft cushion chair. And uh, in, in both groups had to complete both an impression formation task, um, so what they thought about the, the, poem, uh, the, the person that they were talking to, and a negotiation task, which in this case was, was um, uh, putting in a bid for, for, for buying a car. And, yeah, results are that, that the participants who sat in the hard chairs uh, actually judged the, the, the employee, so the person they were facing, to be more stable and less emotional robot interaction. Because, uh, yeah, it, it's quite clear that, that uh, the, the kind of uh, bodily and effective mechanisms that, that we use to interact with each other are mechanisms that robots simply lack, and uh, well, it's an it's an open question whether uh, they should they should have them or they should not have them. But it's quite clear that uh, the way we socially interact with that type of system um, is affected by well, is is affected by that type of embodiment effect, not just by not just by whether or not they look humanoid to some degree, but also. Um, in a strong sense, whether or not they act humanoid and behave humanoid, in the sense that they actually it's, it's, um, display the kind of, uh, in some cases, irrational behavior and effects that, that I've just been talking about. Okay, and the third point here, um, the embodiment of robots still is, um, obviously I would say, very different from the embodiment of humans. And that's also, um, uh, Rolf talked a bit about soft robotics, um, which to some degree, of course, goes into the direction of, of equipping robots with muscles and all that. So you could imagine that, that maybe in 10, 20, or 50 years, maybe you do have robots with facial muscles of the type that humans have, and maybe they do have, they do make the type of association between bodily and then effective and cognitive mechanisms that, that um, these types of results that I've been talking about indicate. But 
anyway, that, that is still far away. Uh, with the robots uh, that we currently have, it's clearly the case that for them, although they might be equipped with human-like arms, they certainly don't associate the same things with that. For them, this movement and that movement uh, have no intrinsic value at all, whereas the, the evidence clearly indicates that for us, even very basic movements such as this and that um, do have an effective value and do affect our behavior. Okay. Um, so, uh, so when it comes to the question, yeah, when it did, if we get back to the question of whether or not computers, uh, whether or not robots are embodied, um, yesterday somebody, Joel, sitting there, raised the question or raised the point or argued the point that the computers are also embodied in the sense that they're physical and they interact with their environment. But that is, of course, that is right if that's, if that's your definition of embodiment, physical and interaction with the world. But it misses the point that in, in human embodied cognition, the embodiment implies that the, the cognitive effective and bodily mechanisms are massively intertwined and largely inseparable. Um, so, in, in for example, if you let's say if you take the extreme case of the um, of the computer with with, with the keyboard as input and, and uh, the screen as an output, it is simply the case that the, the computational mechanisms that the computer uses to to, to do its um, presumed cognitive operations are not in any way they are typically not in any way linked to or constituted by the perceptual or quasi-perceptual and quasi-motor mechanisms that it uses. Um, so the point is not so much that a system is embodied because it is physical and interacts with the environment, but rather because the way it interacts with the world and the way it regulates its body internally, that those are to some degree interlinked with or constitutive of its cognitive mechanisms. That is really the, the key uh, to understanding embodiment, I would say. Which, by the way, um, as I said, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not in this talk talking about um, the underlying mechanisms uh, to, to, to any large degree. But uh, if people are interested in possible explanations for the results that I've been talking about, I would point people to, to um, a recent BBS paper by Michael Anderson, um, which does which discusses the concept of neural reuse and what he calls the, the massive redeployment hypothesis. Um, and, and the argument behind this is that um, in the course of evolution, um, certain neural circuitry was first uh, evolved um, for, 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 for certain purposes. Um, of course, at the beginning of evolution, sensory and motor uh, mechanisms or internal bodily regulation but then um, got later in the course of uh, evolution, got redeployed for all sorts of other mechanisms, including uh, cognitive mechanisms, or what we now call cognitive mechanisms. So in that sense, the, the interaction, or what I call the in inseparability of, of bodily effective and cognitive mechanisms, um, simply stems from the fact that at the brain level, um, although it doesn't necessarily have to be restricted to the brain, but in Anderson's papers, it's mostly focused on the brain. That at the brain level, simply the, the, the mechanisms that, that regulate these things, that regulate bodily movement, that regulate um, effective regulation of the body, that regulate um, cognitive mechanisms, are simply overlapping very strongly, and to, to a large degree are simply the same, uh, the same mechanisms. As I said, well, the, the well-known example of, of, of mirror neurons illustrates uh, the, the case of, 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 of a mechanism that is used both in perception and in action, and um, that is used also in, in, in tasks like, like um, language recognition and so on. Okay, um, I think I'm already on the last slide here. Then, <coughs> from a technological perspective, <coughs> sorry, from a technological perspective, <coughs> I think you could have, you could very well take the kind of um, approach that, that, that Martin talked about yesterday, and you might very well argue that there are good reasons to, to actually avoid complex cases of embodied cognition altogether. Because if you want to build systems, um, and let's take the example that he talked about, if you want to build a robot that navigates um, through the city center of Munich, if you want to do that at this point, 
and you want it to be reliable, um, and presumably somebody is paying you for this, and, and they expect a certain performance and, and all that. Um, of course, at this point, you should use the tools um, that are currently available, and um, well, and those tools are, are classical tools, those, or they, they come from classical um, AI, from classical uh, control engineering, and so on. And whereas, um, when it comes to, to, to embodied cognition and, and, and the type of robotics and AI that is related to that, at this point, they're simply, well, the tools are simply not available at this point. Then again, um, it's of course, uh, you could argue against that. So you can argue, as I just said, you can argue that if you want reliability and if you take an engineering perspective on, on, on uh, providing systems, building systems with a certain performance, then it's obvious that at this point, um, yeah, you should use the techniques that provide you with that performance and that are relatively easy to, to analyze and relatively easy to um, engineer. Whereas, um, that's what the, the last point is here. It is, on the other hand, of course, there are good reasons why people are trying to build humanoid robots and uh, human adapted technologies in the first place. And that reason simply is that um, with the current technologies available, we still, we still cannot build uh, robots that come anywhere close to human performance. So uh, I think the, um, the, the comparison that was made a couple of times yesterday between what has uh, <coughs> traditional AI achieved versus what has embodied AI achieved, or um, yeah, well, what can you do with, 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 with classical control engineering methods as opposed to, to, to what could you do with an embodied perspective. That comparison is, is um, to some degree, degree is, is just completely misguided because what you really need to compare is um, what can we achieve with, with classical techniques and what, uh, what do we know from, from, from what does science tell us that, that humans uh, do uh, achieve with, 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 uh, on the basis of, of embodied cognition. Um, so the, the comparison should not be between what embodied AI has currently, uh, is currently providing as compared to, to, to what traditional AI is currently providing. But the comparison really has to be between um, what, current, what current technology can provide us with and, and what we know that humans are capable of. And then we can use our scientific understanding of what humans are capable of or how they function um, and try to replicate that in the different types of technology or adapt, in the case of, of human computer, uh, human robot interaction, adapt our technologies to what we know how humans function. So if, for example, we know that um, humans associate certain uh, if we know that humans associate certain effective values with, for example, even simple movements such as moving the hand towards the body or away from the body, then of course um, we don't necessarily need to build um, our uh, cognitive robots the same way that humans work. But we, if we build robots that interact with humans, then of course we have to be aware of the way that humans function and the way that humans socially interact with each other, because obviously that affects how they interact. Um, well how they interact with the rest of the world, and how they interact also um, uh, with robots that are part of that world. Okay, um, I think that's all I had to say.